the France 24 debate. We're talking about austerity or bust for Europe. This says uh, the threat of recession looms with Olivier Lecomte of uh, Paris's École Centrale uh, um, University. I suppose you can't call it a university, or can you? I'm not sure. You should. When you're not in France, you should talk, say a university. In France, you say Grande École. Okay. <laughs> uh, from Germany, uh, Marcus Kerber, professor of political economy at Berlin's and uh, Technische Universität. Uh, Thierry Dedieu of the CFTT Trade Union Confederation. Uh, France Venkatz, uh, Douglas Herbert, just back from the G20 summit in Cannes. And uh, we're also pleased to welcome Ambrose Evans Pritchard, international business editor for the Daily uh, Telegraph, um, who uh, wrote a stinging uh, piece in, uh, in the Telegraph on, uh, on this whole issue. We're going to get to it in a moment. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ambrose. Before we do that, uh, I just want to pick up on what was said just before the break. Uh, we heard Marcus Kerber D Douglas talking about uh, the fact that Greece has got to be let go. Portugal, uh, well, they've got issues to sort out before they can uh, stay in the Eurozone. You know, all of that is true. It's hard to argue. I mean, you know, factually, yes, they have issues to sort out, mm. and they are the dangerous, uh, perhaps most vulnerable economies right now. My only fear is this so-called slippery slope that you're on. Once you start to talk about letting certain countries sort of go their own way, dropping out of the Eurozone, you have basically the whole entity starting starting to come apart at the seams. Um, you know, I find it interesting, a few months ago we were talking about peripheral countries. We were talking about the vulnerable countries being those countries on the southern rim of Europe. You don't really hear the word peripheral anymore. It seems that just about everyone, except for Germany, is a peripheral country now. Everyone seems vulnerable, including France, the second biggest economy in the Eurozone. Um, so that's why I think that it becomes dangerous when you start to say, let certain countries go. I think that it's worth trying to work together, try to find a way to hold things together. Carrie Dudu, for you, what's the benchmark in terms of who gets to stay in and who doesn't inside the Eurozone? Well, I think that a, a, as we have accepted a, the 17 member states in the Eurozone, we have to keep them. I mean, we have to find a solution. We knew from the very beginning of the, a, the single currency that the economy were different, so we built a, a, a single currency on different economies, and it never worked. In the, in the history. So when now we have to find a way of solidarity uh, with this country we are suffering at the moment. And what I'm thinking about, that's the most vulnerable people in the countries. I mean, what does it mean, for, for instance, for Greece to uh, kick them off uh, the Eurozone? It will be probably a, a great recession in the country, and the most vulnerable people will suffer even more. Now we have accepted Greece in the Eurozone. We have to find a solution to, to help them to go through. If you can't. Well, well, I agree on, on what, uh, what has been said uh, a moment ago. We, we, we are, we're clearly not through with uh, Greece and Portugal. Uh, so it will take more time and more money to, to save them. The question of keeping them into the Eurozone is, is clearly a political issue. Uh, and as the euro was also a political construction. And now the question is, do we want to keep this political construction? Because we think that the future of Europe is within a, a consolidated uh, political uh, zone, an economical uh, zone, uh, or do we want to play uh, each on, on our side in a very large world where with uh, tremendous powers against us, or against or around us. So uh, my feeling is that we, we've got to go through the end of this very good idea, which, which was the European construction, uh, started uh, uh, dozens of years ago, uh, but we, we've got to accept the consequences, which is uh, to make all the necessary efforts. And I think that out of the G20 meetings, on one in one piece of truth emerged, which was uh, Angela Merkel saying uh, it, it will take 10 years, <laughs> 10 more years, you know, to solve the problems. All right, 10 more years. Right now, though, there's an immediate problem. France unveiling fresh austerity measures this Monday. It's already had one round, including some symbolic ones, like the freezing of the president's pay. Others less symbolic, like the raising of sales tax in the restaurant and construction industries from 55 to 7%. A reminder, we are six months from a presidential election in this country. The uh, French prime minister uh, trying to uh, offer some uh, uh, blunt, t uh, blunt speak to the voters. The word bankruptcy is no longer an abstract word. Our economic, financial and social sovereignty demands collective efforts for an extended period and even some sacrifices. 
uh, I got to read this from uh, often a guest of ours, uh, uh, the uh, Louis Cooper of BGC Partners, writing my question to Nicolas Sarkozy is, has he explained to his electorate that austerity is needed because France has to commit 158 billion euros to funding that European stability fund? Olivier Lecomte, this is the, you were mentioning a minute ago that, you know, solidarity has a price, 158 billion euros. Yes, it's only a stock, but if you spread it over, over years, it's not that, that much money. Uh, uh, no, I think that the problem is not here with today's announcement by the Prime Minister. The thing is, this second plan, so-called second plan, should never have happened in, uh, in the first place. Because why is he... Why has he to, to, to announce these uh, 7 billion further uh, deficit reduction? It's just due to the fact that three months ago he announced a budget based on a uh, assumption of growth, which was 1.75, in which nobody, not absolutely nobody in the world believed. Uh, if he had announced 1% growth for next year, he would have taken the necessary steps from, from the very beginning. He wouldn't have had to announce these 7 billion savings uh, today. Thierry de Dieu, what other options does the Prime Minister have today but to announce these hikes and VAT taxes and stuff? Well, actually, I mean, a, among the various measures, because we can talk about, let's say, kind of dusting of measures, uh, uh, some of them are just dedicated for, to an increase in VAT. The others are on a postponing <coughs> the age of retirement. I mean, to speeding up uh, the, the raising of the retirement the, age. The, the retirement mm -hmm. age. Um, now, now we we do think that uh, the plan which, which has been announced today is not appropriate. I mean, we would have liked uh, the government to announce uh, some support uh, for uh, the economy, uh, some support for non for employment. And we did not have any of that. So, I mean, the activity, the economic activity, the industrial activity is somewhere forgotten in, in, in the French plan which has been announced today. Let's bring in Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Uh, Ambrose, uh, uh, it's more austerity, yet more austerity, not much on growth. Yeah, I mean, you can sort of see in each country this argument's being made, but if all these countries are simultaneously tightening fiscal policy, you get into this uh, early 1930s sort of downward spiral. They just drag each other down. And what we're going to get next year in the whole industrial world, according to the IMF, is fiscal tightening of almost 2% of GDP. Nothing's been seen like that since the Second World War. So, I mean, where's the, where's the growth going to come from? And, you know, at least in the case of the Anglo-Saxon countries, it's being offset by a very aggressive monetary policy and monetary reflation, which is somewhat mitigating the damage. Um, in, in Europe, it's been, has been until last week, at least, compounded by monetary tightening, and that's the problem. So you had, you had, you know, both instruments were pointing in the wrong way and tipping the entire eurozone system back into recession. It's absolutely inevitable. Um, what, what has occurred could have been predicted, was predicted. It was unnecessary, and it was caused by policy mistakes. Um, a couple of comments, by the way, from. Uh uh, uh, on Twitter, uh, No Pasa writes, the scale of government has to match the economy. Never-ending expansion of the government percentage of GNP cannot go on ad pauperatus. I love that, ad pauperatus. Um, uh, uh, but not everyone agrees. Michael Thomas Carlucci on our Facebook page says that uh, uh, increasing austerity is suicidal. It's not about cutting spending. It's about changing priorities. The money is there to do a lot. The question is, why is it being spent on some things and not on others. Um, would you agree, uh, uh, Olivier Lecomte, that uh, there is money out there, it's just in the wrong place? Yeah, I think it's very true, because we, we, are, we are spending, uh, I don't know, but more than 300 um, billion euros uh, for, for in France every year. I mean, that's the, 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 the uh, national budget. And uh, the question is now um, what we decide for the future and how we decide to, to spend the money, uh, in, for example, in education, in research, or do we want to, to still have uh, this ta tax cut for, for uh, restaurants and hotels and uh, like uh, was announced a couple of years ago? Um, so I think that the big problem with today's announcement and the previous announcements is that uh, it's not a, a global scheme. You know, we have no big plans. We have no visibility. And I think that's a, a real problem today. Um, people, um, either consumers or uh, companies, corporations, uh, do not know exactly what will happen and when, when will be the n coming the next uh, austerity plan. And I think that's a terrible mistake. We should at least try to focus on the longer-term plan with uh, 
audacious measures, uh, not you know coming back every two months saying, oh, we've forgotten to tell you, but we, we, we need to cut another couple of billions. Uh, that's terrible for, for, for the confidence of the market. All right, so short term. Can uh, I bring in here my point of view, perhaps? So you can. I'd like to contradict. Um, the, our French friend has uh, made a few comments which, of course, provoke uh, uh, my contradiction. Uh, there is enormous space for austerity measures in France. If you look at the gigantic military um, budget in France, with the projects which are no longer of military use, all the submarine fleet, in particular the nuclearly, the, 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 with nuclear propulsion, uh, you could really very much debate the sense of such um, arms. This is no, a taboo in France simply because it's part of the Soviet sector, what I call the Soviet <laughs> sector, because uh, it is uh, a part of this military complex which is untouchable, where communist trade unions and uh, um, engineers tra uh, trained at Ecole... Uh, but in, in fairness, they have Tile caused a lot of military a, bases in France. A, a, unholy, a very unholy co coalition. So there is a Santa Claus list of all military people, what sort of projects they still want. It is um, still under cover, and after the election there will be the day of truth, and they will, there will be cuts, and there must be cuts. There are enormous possibilities of cuts in the, the field of French finance, in the field, particularly with these very, very uh, sophisticated, specialized, privileged pension schemes for civil servants. These pension schemes are, have already been project of reform in 1996. You know the result. This is the time when I learned that b biking is better than taking the car in, in, uh, in, in Paris. So the, the, there was a standstill of the country and Mr. Juppé was out, voted out of office. So the, the question is whether France is capable of reform, and Mr. Sarkozy promised reform, and when he took office, he spent, and he did a lot of a deficit spending. I remind you of this mere figure. In one year between 2007 and 2008, uh, an increase of 4% of GNP uh, in, in terms of debt. This is gigantic. So today, France has n almost no maneuver. This is not a, no, an austerity program. This is a mixture of selling uh, false cosmetic austerity measures and some symbolic measures to make the markets believe that France is on the way, on the way of virtue or on the way of um, fiscal virtue and to let the voters know, well, this is a, a socially balanced one. France has never believed in uh, fiscal rules in the rules of fiscal um, uh, of balanced budgets and today um, uh, for the president as prime ministers a real austerity program would be suicidal but it, it is the consequences of his omissions from 2007 onwards let me make a final comment on my French friend's remark on the, uh, the euro being a, a political project this is a very French way of thought you declare a project political, and thereby you wipe out any sense of political of economic reasoning. Uh, of course it is a political project, but if a political project has turned out to be economically unfeasible, you have to draw conclusions from that, uh, declaring it a political project and thereby sacrificing, sacrificing virtually um, not only um, the, the rating of countries like, like uh, Italy and, and Spain, but sacrificing in the long run even the AAA rating of the trade surplus country would bring Europe to the precipice. And I think uh, French economists, excellent as you are, have to weigh up the pros and cons of such a policy. All right. Well, well, I just want to bring in the, the odd man out in this uh, because he's not in the Eurozone. Ambrose uh, Evans Pritchard. It, it seems as though it was uh, just yesterday that Tony Blair was thinking about a referendum to join the euro. Uh, yeah, well, that seems a long time ago now. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I think that's. Uh, I mean, we've now got about 80 members of, the, of, of, of Parliament, um, you know, calling, basically pushing for uh, in a referendum that might lead to Britain, Britain leaving the EU altogether. So it's kind of moved on a long way. Um, mm. I don't think that's going to happen, but. Uh, uh, clearly, the mood, is, the mood is hardened, and probably the EU and certainly the euro has never been as unpopular in British polls as it is now. Now, Ambrose, uh, you, you were in your column, uh, you spared the French mostly. You were uh, a little bit harder on the Italians, though. You said Italy is in the wrong currency. It should not be in Germany, Germany's monetary union at all. What do you see as the future now for Rome? 
Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I don't actually, I'm, I don't actually blame the the countries in southern Europe entirely for the difficulty they're in. It took two to tango. The creditor states in the north who flooded these countries over 10, 12 years with excess cheap capital are as much to blame. You know, both sides are to blame. So first of all, I'm not blaming any country. You know, and, and, and the, the difficulty with Italy now is that, is that um, uh, its economy is going into a deep, deep recession. Uh, some of the private forecasters there are predicting uh, uh, a slump all the way through next year, all the way through 2013. You're talking about a, a depression there. And, it, and it's, it's that that's now sort of causing the collapse of confidence in the Italian bond markets in part. Uh, you know, people are looking, looking at the debt trajectory and they can see with this kind of uh, level of growth, it's just not, it's not going to work. And, and, and furthermore, immediately, you don't have any backstop measure in place whatsoever um, to, to rescue the Italian bond markets because the rescue fund, the EFSF, isn't really operative at all. It doesn't have any money. It's turning out to be essentially to be a fiction. Uh, and the, com the, you know, the complex way that they've designed it has discredited it, so they, they can't even raise money itself very easily on the markets. There was a, essentially a failed auction today by the EFSF. And the, the ECB is it, it, essentially a German veto on its coming in and acting as a lender of last resort. So if you don't have a central bank behind the system with, uh, operating as a genuine lender of last resort, in my opinion, it can't function. Um, I mean, they, they have to come to terms with this. You know, either you break up the euro in an orderly fashion and get on with it, or you create the instruments you needed to make it work, and that is a proper central bank as a lender of last resort and probably fiscal union with euro bonds, debt sharing, fiscal transfers, the whole nine yards. They have to do, they have to do it properly, but they're not facing up to any of these implications. Very briefly, Thierry de Dieu, because we're, al we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, growth, it's going to stall in Italy, it's going to stall elsewhere, possibly in France. What do you do? Well, I think that we have to take the right measure. I mean, a, the money is available. I mean, for instance, in France, you've got something on overtime. You've got a tax exemption on overtime. If you get an abolition on that, you get far, uh, 4 billion euros. That's a start. Uh, you need also to dialogue with uh, the people. And we had no social dialogue at all with the government on the various measures that have been announced today. And then the most vulnerable people will suffer. No, sol solutions are existing, but you have to support, you have to promote the real economy. You have to promote the activity. If you don't do so, you will be still in the crisis. And let me recall that we are facing a situation of huge debt. Uh, of course, the debt was existing before, but because of the crisis we are facing since uh, 2007, and the people who are going right, to so pay the price for that are the people who are not responsible for it, and this is not acceptable. All right. We're going to unfortunately have to leave it there. I want to thank you, Thierry de Dieu. I want to thank uh, Marcus Kerber in Berlin. I want to Ambrose Evans Pritchard for joining us uh, from London, uh, France 24, Douglas Herbert and Olivier Lecomte, and thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Stay with us. Coming up next, uh, there's uh, more on our spinning economy. It's with uh, Marcus Carlson that's in business. Stay with us.